Everybody say hi to those who are watching us in the internet, in the YouTube, all over the world. The satellites say good day, <laughs> blessed day. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Everybody say hi. Good. Today, I'd like to continue our series on Alpha and Omega, the eternal God who never changes. Last week, we talked about how God loves us. Do you recall? In the Old Testament. God loves us. How? Do you recall? Undeserved, pursuing, and redemptive, unfathomable love of God. In the past few weeks, you and I have been learning about God's love for us and how we are to love one another. Today, I want to share with you from the Old Testament how to love God. Next week, I'll share with you from the Old Testament again how to love God. And then we'll share with you from the New Testament how to love God. Why is that important? You see, it is one thing to know that God loves you. It's one thing to learn how to love one another. By the way, how do you love one another? Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, I love you in spite of. <laughs> to love one another is a commitment, remember? It's a commitment. It transcends feelings. It is to seek their highest good. Remember? Which oftentimes require sacrifice. Ladies, gentlemen, we have been learning how to love one another, but the problem is this. How do you love God? Are you ready? So today, I want to share with you how to love God. Are you ready? All right. Let's begin by this amazing chapter. It's called Genesis chapter 22. Everybody, if you, if you don't mind, please read Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. It came about after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, here I am, and Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then the next verse, I'd like you to read also. Let's go to the next verse. He said, take now your sons, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. The first two verses, I want you to notice something. Let's go back to verse one. That's the first time you have the word test. God tested Abraham. In theology, it is important to know many times if the word is used for the first time. Here you learn that God tested Abraham. Many times we don't understand testing. And what is a test all about? It has to do with verse 2, the love of Abraham. The first time the word love is used also in the entire Bible is the love of a father to a son. Now, why is God testing Abraham? Let me first introduce this topic by asking you an honest question. How many of you like testing? You love testing. Raise your hand. 99% of you are normal. You don't like testing. I don't like testing. Why? Because testing is not pleasant. Yes or no? So, do you like testing? Of course not. But does God test you? Yes. How does God test us? Think, how does God test you? Would you like to know how that word is used in the Bible? That word test from the Hebrew word nasa means what? God tests to always build us up, to reveal what is inside us so that you will know your weaknesses, your strength. Believe it or not, the Greek word for that is perasmos. That was the Greek translation used when the Bible was translated 300 years before Christ, the Greek version of the Old Testament. That word perasmos is used in the New Testament to describe as follows, so that you will know God tests us and your attitude toward testing will change. Remember, testing is not always pleasant. Let's read James chapter 1, verse 2. 
Everybody, consider it all joy. Now, this is crazy. What do you mean all joy? My brethren, talking to believers, when you encounter various trials, this word various trials is the word perasmus, testings. This time it talks about trials, testing. Knowing that the, everybody read, testing of your faith, perasmus, same word, testing, perasmus. God tests our faith. For what purpose? To do something good in your life. Produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Well, when the Bible uses the word perfect, it does not mean sinless, but it means you become fully mature. So, what is testing? Testing is God's way of letting you know what is inside you. It stretches your faith. It makes you stronger. So tell your neighbor, testing is good for you. Tell your neighbor, testing is good for you. You may not like tests. Some of you are undergoing testing now. Perhaps sickness. Perhaps death of loved ones. Perhaps financial problem. I don't know what's happening in your life. But I have good news for you. For God's people, testing is a blessing. But you need to understand how you respond is everything. And that's why I want you to learn this important topic. How do you love God when you are being tested? Another word used in the Bible is exactly the same. It is found in 1 Corinthians. This word testing. Everybody please read. No temptation. No perasmus. So that word, testing, can be translated as temptation, trials. Understand? Same word. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. In other words, you are not alone when you go through testing, when you go through trials. God is faithful. Everybody say that with me. God is faithful. He is so faithful. He will allow you to be tempted, but he does not leave you alone. God is faithful who will not allow you to be perasmus, to be tempted beyond what you are able. God calibrates his testing. But with the temptation, with the perasmus, will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. So what's the point? The point is, God will test you, but you have good assurance. Whatever God allows, you will be able to endure it. If you are tempted with pornography, which a lot of men are, and now a lot of women are, it is a real challenge. However, temptation is not a sin. But you've got to claim this promise. Lord, I'm now tempted. Example, at nighttime, you are tempted to click on something. What must you do? I advise this to all young people. When you are tempted, number one, realize it's not a sin. And number two, realize God wants to help you. So I call this the five-minute principle. Make it three minutes, five minutes. You get on your knees. Before you click anything, you tell God, Lord, I am tempted. I want to click onto it. I need help. I don't have the strength. Will you take over? Do nothing for the next five minutes. And after five minutes, you report to me what happens to you, okay? In my experience, when you are tempted, you learn God will intervene. By the way, how do you deal with temptation, especially sexual temptation? You run. Do you run away from temptation? That's why we advise young people, watch your cell phone at night. Watch your computer at night. I tell parents, parents, you are responsible when you allow your kids to have cell phones and computer and there's no safeguard. You are opening a gateway for their own mind becoming polluted. Everybody wants the secret of temptation, you run. Remember that song? Run, 
Samson ran. Remember that song? Do you know that song? How many of you know that song? Uh, as for old people like me. Run, Samson, run. Delilah's on the way. Do you know how most of us run? Delilah is coming. You know what most men will do? Run, Samson, run. You know what? You blame Satan all the time. Satan made me do it. Excuse me. You did it. Not Satan. Agree? So, what's the lesson today? This is the topic. I want you to embrace this in your heart. God allows testing for what purpose? Do you love God? Everybody say that with me. Do you love God? This is foundational. Can you answer that question? Do you love God? If your answer is yes, I say praise God. Next question. How do you know you love God? How do you show you love God? How do you show it? That's where most people are very shallow. I'm very concerned with Christianity today, especially Western Christianity. Because God has blessed the West. Because of their faith in Christ, God bless Europe, God bless America. But when a nation is blessed, the tendency is to stop loving God and turn away from God. And Christianity becomes a performance. Christianity becomes a religion of convenience, not from the heart. So I want to share with all of us, those of you who are watching us, question is this, do you love God? And how do you love God? Let's look at the Bible to learn together. Principle number one about loving God is obedience. Say that with me. Obedience. How do you show you love God? Answer, obedience. But why is loving God so crucial? Same question Jesus asked Peter. When Peter failed, when Peter denied Jesus three times at the end of the ministry, what was the first thing Jesus did when he encountered Peter and the disciples? He asked Peter a simple question. Shall we read that together? John 21. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, everybody read, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? You see, the test of love is always a comparative question. Nothing wrong with your family. Nothing wrong with your children. The challenge is this. Do you love me more than you love these things? Nothing wrong with li loving Isaac. But do you love me more than you love Isaac? So my question to you today, do you love God? Is he number one? Please answer that privately. Next, you ask your neighbor, do you love God? Ask your neighbor and tell me their answer. Do you love God? Okay, let's continue reading. God tells Abraham how to love him. He tells him simply, Genesis chapter two, verse two, take now your son, your only son. Notice, your son, your only son. What happened to Ishmael? Genesis chapter 21. God told Abraham, surrender Ishmael to me. Ishmael was causing problem. Any man, you know, you experience this, when you have more than one wife, and you live together, as a general rule only, as a general rule. If you have more than one family, is that family chaotic, yes or no? Is it problematic? As a rule. So Hagar was causing problem. So Sarah told husband, I want you to get rid of Hagar, get rid of Ishmael. Abraham was so troubled because Ishmael was his son. Then God appeared to Abraham. God said, Abraham, don't worry. I will take care of Ishmael. I will take care of Hagar. 
I will bless them. You do what your wife tells you. Because, listen now, because Isaac is the promised son, not Ishmael. Are we clear? So that's the context. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Go to the land of Moriah. I will talk about Moriah in a short while. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now, fathers, raise your hand. Who are fathers here? Fathers, raise your hand. How many of you will do what God asked you to do? Is it easy or no? I don't think it's easy. But I want to encourage you. Obedience is seldom easy. Yes or no? Two ways to obey God, reluctantly or willingly, grudgingly or joyfully. You can obey God in fear or you can obey God in faith, anticipation. What happened to Abraham? How did he obey? Can you guess? You will not know the implication of this word, you love. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. I want to share with you the love of Abraham for Isaac. How it was so special. The first time God promised Abraham, remember, between chapter, Chapter 22, what is the chapter before 22? What is the chapter before 22? Louder. 21. He's smart. Do you know how many years have transpired before 21 and 22? Over 25 years. If you stop in chapter 21 and you read 22, you think it's just the next day. No, 20 years have gone by. And I'll tell you why I believe in that. But do you know how old was Abraham when God promised him a child? How many of you know how old was Abraham when God promised him you will have a son? How many know how old Abraham was? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Higher, higher, higher. Six, seven, eight, nine. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Excuse me. Jim, are we teaching our people Bible? This is most foundational, the book of Genesis. I preached on this years ago. Ah, you are not yet born. Okay, no problem. Abraham was 75 years old. Okay? I'll prove to you. Look at Genesis chapter 12. When God appeared to Abraham, God unilaterally gave this amazing promise. God told Abraham, Abraham, I will make you a great nation. Boss, walang anak pa ito. Genesis 11 tells us Sarah was barren. Abraham's wife cannot have children. Now, Abraham told him, I'll make you a great nation. Just think about the humor of this amazing promise. I will bless you. Your name will be great. You shall be a blessing. You know, God bless us to be a blessing. Look at God's promises. Continue. I will bless those who bless you. And that's why I always tell people, be careful of how you deal with the Jewish people. God made a promise. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God made this amazing promise. Abraham, through you, all the families will be blessed. And how old was Abraham? Abraham was 75 years old. Okay? Now, 10 years later, Abraham was still waiting for the promised child. Abraham kept asking Sarah, his wife, Mrs. Kumusta? Every end of the month. Oh, Kumusta? Sabi ni Mrs. Mrs. He, Mrs. Sarah said, <clears throat> nothing. Keep trying. Keep trying. No child yet. In short, after 10 years, you, you are now in Genesis chapter what? 15. 
You know, Abraham was very honest. Abraham negotiated with God. Abraham said, oh Lord, what will you give me since I am childless? Your promise is not yet fulfilled. So he gave God a solution. What was the solution? Abraham said, the heir of my house is Eleazar. Can we make him the promised descendant? Abraham said, since you have given me no offspring, one born in my family is my heir. Do you understand the mind of Abraham? In that culture, you can adopt a son of your slave. Let him be the heir. You know what God said? Uh-uh. That's not my promise. My promise is this man will not be your heir, but one will come from you, your own body. And then God told him, even Sarah will come from you and Sarah. You know, Abraham was so confused. How can that be? I am childless. And then God told Abraham, let's take a walk. You know, they did take a walk. Can you read what they did? Took him outside, look at the heavens, count the stars. If you're able to count them, so will your descendants be. So Abraham started counting. One, two. How many stars can you count? Tell me, with physical eyes. Louder. Yes. scientists dito. How many? No, no, with your physical eyes, you can count. If you don't believe me, you try tonight. Maybe 7,000. But if you don't believe me, you try. Then convince me next week, okay? So Abraham counted. Remember, they don't have telescope. Telescope will tell you billions, but the naked eyes, not so many. When I bring people to the Holy Land and the sky is bright, but everything is dark, you can see the stars. But the point is this, Abraham believed him. And then when Abraham believed him, you know what he believed? So shall your descendants be. Now you have to understand, I don't even have one son of my own. And you are telling me, I would have so many descendants. And God said, yes. Based on that faith, the most important verse about justification in the Old Testament is this. He believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. God declared Abraham as righteous on one condition. You believe me. My friend, that is how the Old Testament saints are declared righteous before God. It's all by faith. You are righteous. Then, another 10 years went by. How old is Abraham by now? 75. Genesis 15, around 85. And now Abraham is 100 years old. Keep asking the wife, Mrs. Pano? Awanin. In Ilocano, awanin. In Tagalog, none. Wala. In Chinese, bo. In Spanish, de nada, or whatever it is. No kids. No baby. Ah, God told him, simple. God says, I will tell you what's going to happen. You know what happened? God said to his wife, okay? God told his wife. Would you like to know what God told his wife? Look at Genesis 18. God told Sarah, I will surely return to you at... God told Abraham, I will return to you this time. Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Look at God's timing. The promise has no timetable. But in Genesis chapter 18, God gave him a timetable. The timetable is next year. You will have a son. Abraham said, Sarah, Sarah, uh, the Bible says Abraham and Sarah were old. What is old in Tagalog? Matandana. Advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. In short, no more. The factory is closed. To you na in Tagalog, to you, to you. No more. You can have babies. Not only are you barren, you are past childbearing. Sarah laughed. After I become old, shall I have pleasure? 
my Lord being old also. Do you notice he's connecting childbearing with sex and pleasure? And he said, malabo ito. How can that be? You know what? God is so amazing. God said, next year, next year. So do you want to know what happened next year? All right. Look at verse chapter 21 before 22. Next year, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now you understand why Isaac is loved by Abraham and Sarah. It's called a special child. I have been waiting for this. I have been praying for this. After 25 years, he was born. Do you know the name Isaac means what? Isaac means what? Laughter. God has made laughter. So the word Isaac really is laughter. Can you imagine calling your son? Ha <laughs> yeah. That's what you call your son, laughter. Beautiful. Now, let's find out. What did Abraham do? Well, let's look at Genesis 22, 3 and 4. Now that you understand that love of Abraham, will he obey God? Will he not obey God? Let's look. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men, Isaac, split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place. Abraham and his son took a long walk, three days. It's, it's a long walk. Not only that, the Bible tells us Abraham rose early in the morning. When God asked Abraham to do something, the test of love, what did Abraham do? Did he postpone it? Did he pray about it? Did he have a discussion with his wife what they should do? Huh. Early in the morning, what can you learn? Instant obedience. Everybody read this. Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is obedience. I know many CCFers. You know what God wants you to do. But you kept postponing it. Yes or no? You know. Alam mo na I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray about it. My friend, if you know it is God's will, you obey. Hallelujah. Amen? Obey. Now, the question is this. Why is obedience the evidence of love? Very simple. Look at John 14, 15. Let's read this together. Jesus says, if you love me, everybody read. You keep my commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, you obey me. So my friend, don't play games. Be honest with yourself. Do you love God? Can you ask your neighbor, do you love God? My friend, to love God, you need to grow. It's hard to love somebody you don't know. It's hard to love somebody you don't trust. It took time for Abraham to know the Lord. My advice to you is this. God loves you. He gave his all for you. All he's asking you to do now is love him. How do you love him? First word, obey. O, I'm going to give you an acronym you will never forget. How do you love God? Say that with me. Obey. So give me examples of obedience that God wants you to do now, but you're not doing it. Example, letting go of sin, anger, bitterness. There's no debate. Let go. Pornography, no debate. Unwholesome relationships. Any relationship that's causing you to sin, let go. Unforgiveness, let go. Forgiving and asking for forgiveness. Some of you, God is asking you, you go see your friend, see your father, see your mother, see your loved ones, ask for forgiveness. Do it. Obedience. Stewardship of money. Tithing. I don't know how you deal with your money, but I want you to know God owns everything, not you. Spiritual disciplines. 
quiet time, prayer, attending small groups, worship. These are all ways we show God that we love him. You know what's very sad? Is sometimes, well, it's so simple, we make it so complicated. You can study all the Bible you want. You can attend 10 Bible studies a week. But friend, if you don't obey God, you are not loving him. And obedience is so basic. Number two, faith. What do you mean by faith? Well, do you love God? Number two, faith. O, F. What do you think is the third one? Uh, suspense. Number two, faith. What do you mean faith? Look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. Abraham said to the young man, stay here with a donkey. I and the lad will go and we will worship and return. Obedience becomes easier. Loving God becomes easier if you trust him. Look at what Abraham said. We will go. What did God ask Abraham to do? Sacrifice your son. But what did Abraham say? We will go and worship and come back. Have you thought about it? Faith. Look at the next verse. Abraham said, Abraham took, took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Isaac cannot be a boy. Isaac was a man by this time. The wood is heavy. A wood for burnt offering means you will burn it until the body is completely burned. So, Isaac is no longer a man. Josephus, the famous historian, he was Jewish. He was religious. According to him, Isaac was around 25 years old. Now, I don't want to debate about it. All I'm telling you right now is Isaac was no longer a boy. He was a man. He laid it on Isaac, the wood. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked together. To me, it must be one of the most monumental walk of the entire life of Abraham. I'm walking with my son. What are they going to talk about? Believe it or not, they talk about the sacrifice. The son said, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father. My father... And he said, here I am, my son. Behold the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Is that a fair question to ask? Daddy, you have the fire. Remember the fire, they don't have matches. They don't have, you know, uh, so simple to make fire. It, it, it's hard to make fire. You have the fire. We have the wood. Where is the offering? Now, if you were Abraham, what would you say? This is what he said. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked together. As far as Abraham was concerned, God promised me that my son will be the future heir. Therefore, how can my son die? I don't know what he will do, but I trust him. Do you understand the faith of Abraham? Yeah. When God asks you to do something, you don't have to know all the consequences. You leave the consequences to him. Your job is to obey. You leave the consequences to God. That is obedience and that is faith. You know the Bible tells us Hebrews 11.6 Without faith, everybody read this. Without faith, it is now there. It is hard. It is difficult. It is impossible to please God. And some of you are trying to please God, but you don't have faith. What is faith? Very simple. Faith. He who comes to God must believe that he is. You must believe not only God exists, that he is God. Not only is he God, you must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. How many of you believe God is a rewarder? Let me raise your hand. With all my heart, 
I believe God is good and God is a rewarder. Do you believe God is a rewarder to those who seek him? Yes or no? So what is faith in God? Very simple. Faith in God, let me explain to you now. Faith in God is anchored on an object. Faith always has an object. Our object is God's promises and God's character. Faith, listen to me, is not a feeling. That's why you are confused. You think it's a feeling. Never. Faith always has an object. Example, if you tell people, you know, I believe in Mr. So-and-so. What are you believing? You see what I'm saying? You cannot just say, I believe. No, no. Faith always has an object. When you take the airplane, you are putting your faith on the airplane, you are putting your faith on the pilot. Yes or no? When I drink this water, where am I putting my faith? Answer, I'm putting my faith that this water is not poison. Yes or no? <laughs> you, you, you exercise faith all the time. My question is, why don't you trust God? So the Bible tells us, Abraham's faith was anchored on who God is and his character. That's why the Bible repeats. The Bible tells us in Romans 4, 20, 21, with respect to the promise of God, Abraham did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. Your faith can grow as long as you focus on God's word, God's promises. If you do not know God's word, you don't know God's promises, let me ask you, what's the basis of your faith? What are you counting on? You don't know the Bible. You have never read the Bible. You don't even know how old was Abraham when I asked you. You are not studying the Bible. Being, read this together. Being fully assured that what God had promised, he's able to perform. Are you willing to bet your entire life on the promises of God, yes or no? Listen to me, I'm not asking you to put your faith in us. Don't put your faith on people. Don't put your faith in CCF. Don't put your faith in religion. Put your faith on God, His word, His promises, His character. To have faith in God, you must answer me now, yes or no, aloud, huh? Do you believe that God is good? Okay, most people believe here, this one. Do you believe God is good? Yes. Do you believe God knows everything? Yes. You do. Do you believe God knows what is best for you? Yes. Do you believe God loves you? Yes. If God loves you, do you believe God wants what's best for you? Yes. All right, if you believe all of that, that's the meaning of faith. No matter what happens to you, you believe God knows everything, you believe God wants what's best for you, so what do you do? Obey Him. So don't complicate Christianity. Look at Hebrews 11 about why Abraham offered his son. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He did it by faith. Well, he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. You see, Abraham received the promises of God, and yet he understood, he put two and two together. It was he whom it was said in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered everybody. God is able to raise people even from the dead, and from which he also received him back as a type. When the Bible uses the word type, it's also prophetic. Isaac is a type of Christ, which I'll explain in a short while. In the meantime, I want you to hear the testimony of a doctor. Let's welcome Dr. Doc Abbott. Amazing testimony about faith, trusting God. Good afternoon. I began early in life with a poor boy's dream to be successful someday. To achieve this, I knew I needed to excel in everything I do. So early on, it has always made me feel good whenever I'm noticed for excelling, especially in academics. 
I knew I had an edge with others because, uh, because of this, it made me proud. My sole purpose for my life as I pursued academic excellence is to have recognition and be the best in my field and have a comfortable life. I would consider myself a good person. I never did anything to hurt others and was generally nice. I was set for life because I knew that if I do my best, I can achieve whatever I've set my mind into. This was my mindset as I became a doctor, got married, and eventually became a father of three. I was invited to practice my profession in Bulacan. I agreed and moved there even my wife and I did not know anyone in the area. Little did I know that this was already God's hand at work in my life. During this time, I was enjoying the prestige and even the challenges of my practice as internist. I did my best and tried to make a name for myself, and I was succeeding. Slowly, people recognized and started referring more and more patients. I was gaining popularity, and my career was taking off. I would spend hours in the hospital and would always say yes to every opportunity to advance my career. I was a Christian already, but I did not place God at the center of my life. My family even became less of a priority. And whenever I had to say no to spending time with them, I would rationalize that I was doing all of this for them. In 1997, the petition for my whole family to immigrate to the U.S. suddenly got approved. We have been praying for this for a long time, and it would mean greener pasture. It made sense to just go because, as some would say, it was a chance of a lifetime. But instead of immediately jumping at this opportunity, God led me to seek his direction for me and my family. And as I prayed and sought the counsel of others, God impressed in my heart that his plan is for me and my family to stay in the Philippines. We obeyed and trusted God for this decision not to go. However, in January 8, 1999, a tragic event happened to our family. The car of my wife was driving together with our firstborn son was hit by a truck that caused his sudden death. But thankfully, with only minor injuries in my wife. I could not explain the pain my family had to go through because of what happened to our son. I felt helpless and frustrated being a doctor for my inability to do anything to extend his life, even for a few hours. Suddenly, the excitement, the prestige, and the desire to be the best in my profession became irrelevant. I also felt so much regret for not spending more time with him. It was hard for me to get back on my feet after my son passed away. But God, used this very painful time in my life to wake me up and bring me back to an intimate relationship with him. He used people to comfort and remind me of God's love. God used the death of my son to make me realize that life is not just about being successful and having the best of things. My life is not about me. It's about God and what he wants me to do. It's about glorifying him with the skills that he has entrusted to me. I then started to spend more time seeking God through his word and made sure to make my family a priority next to God. It was this time that Pastor Eddie and Dr. Annabel invited me and my wife to attend Bible studies, retreats, and CCF Malolos worship. Eventually, we joined their discipleship group and started serving in different ministries in the church. I began inviting people to church and eventually started leading my, our, own, our own small group. I also became part of the Council of Servants of Malolos and eventually became satellite overseer. Long time ago, Pastor Eddie talked to me and encouraged me to consider and pray to become a pastor of CCF. At that point in my life, all I wanted to do was obey God wherever he was calling me. Arlene, my wife, expressed her apprehensions. She was worried about our children's education 
as they were both planning to pursue medicine. But as I prayed, God reminded me that all my life, it has always been him who provided for all the things we needed. My wife and I continued to obey God no matter where he asked us to go. We continued discipling others, serving in the church, and as we did, we experienced God more and more. Our D group has multiplied to several generations. From overseeing CCF Malolos, I have been tasked to be the lay pastor of CCF Central Luzon, then Central Luzon Hub A. As for my children, both have now finished the course they wanted to pursue. I believe that all of this were only possible through God's amazing grace, strength, and provision. And I now realize that long before I came to know Christ, the hand of God was already leading me into the path where I will encounter him and experience his love even through pain. Today, the only reason I'm standing here before you is because of the immeasurable love for me. We lost a son, but God blessed us with many spiritual sons and daughters in Christ. I am Abed Farinas. To my God who has orchestrated all things in my life for his purpose, to him be glory and honor. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. What do you notice? Trials will come. How you respond is everything. Going to the States or giving up the ministry, but by the grace of God, he surrendered his pain, everything. So I've invited the wife. He has two children. One is a boy, one is a girl. Both are now doctors. But this is the doctor internist, right, Irene? And uh, Eddie Robles and Annabelle. Eddie is a businessman who is now a pastor. And Annabelle is a doctor who is now a pastora. So are you excited about what a small group can do to help people? Yes or no? So why don't you all raise your right hand. I want you to ask yourself, is God asking you to join a small group? I have good news for you. You watch for the announcement. We are going to announce on a regular basis now when the training program for those who want to be a D group leader, I want you to join. It will be on a Sunday. And those of you who want to join a small group, you have been signing your name, giving your name, and nobody's calling you. We will have a table and people to meet you right there and there you connect. Is that okay with you guys? So raise your right hand. Father God, I praise you and I thank you for Doc Abbott and his wife Arlene for what you have done in their lives and thank you for blessing them with two wonderful children who are now doctors and how you have provided for them faithfully. Even though he's a self-supporting doctor, I praise, I praise you that you are faithful to him and for Eddie Robles and Annabelle who have given their lives in pursuing your calling of discipling others. So I pray for the satellites in Malolos, in Bulacan, in Central Luzon, that you will continue to grow, continue to encourage people to become your followers. And I commit to you their future, expand their borders. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Doc. You know, in Romans, well, let's go to the last point now. Do you love God? Answer, how do you love God? Yes or no? Well, how do you know you love God? Number one, O. What is O? Obedience. What is number two? Faith. O, F, W. What is W? Worship. Do you worship God? even when you are disappointed or you don't know what's going to happen? Well, let me define for you. There are many definitions. But in the next few weeks, we'll be discussing this about loving God. Everybody, simple definition. Worship is the ultimate expression of our love for God. How do you express that love for Him? What makes me sad is shallow Christianity. What is shallow Christianity? People think it's singing. They think singing is worship. Dancing, clapping, jumping up and down. My friend, 
Worship may include all of those. But worship is more than just singing. Worship is really giving God your utmost. It is giving Him our best. And many times, worship can be costly. It may not be convenient. Are we clear? So let me explain to you worship. How did Abraham demonstrate his worship? Let's go on the reading. They came to a place of which God told him, Abraham, build the altar. Building an altar is not yet worship. And arrange the wood. That's not yet worship. Bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. Can you imagine Isaac? How many of you will follow Isaac to willingly surrender your entire life to your father? Will you run away, yes or no? Ako pala yun, huh? Why are you tying me? Isaac, a man of faith. He knew his father. He knew God. Isaac knew. He's God's appointed heir. I'm sure Abraham told him stories after stories, how God intervened. Isaac was a man of faith. And he worshiped God by submitting to God's will. On top of the wood, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay him. Do you know this? Abraham's worship was not theoretical. He was willing to sacrifice his best for God. What happened? Read the next verse. Angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. Do not stretch out your hand on the lad. Do nothing to him. For now I know you fear God, and since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Two, three observations. Number one, the angel. The angel of the Lord means a messenger of God. And many scholars explain to us, right in this chapter, you see the Trinity. Who is this angel of the Lord? Who is the messenger of God? People say, this is Jesus. Why do I say, look at the grammar. The grammar changes. Abraham, Abraham, don't do that. Now I, who is this I? I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Who is claiming to be God? The messenger, the angel, that's Jesus. Glimpse of Trinity. Secondly, what do you notice? Abraham, at the last minute, God told Abraham, don't do that. You know why? God is very clear in Leviticus. God is against any children's sacrifice. But this time, when the Bible says, now I know, it does not mean God did not know. But God wanted Abraham to know for himself that he loved the Lord. Abraham will never know how much he loved God until God was given, until he was given the opportunity. And God empathizes with us. God feels, and God says, I know you love me. Let's read the next verse. Abraham raised his eyes and looked, behold, a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. Abraham went, took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. That's the music we sang. Jehovah Jireh. That's the name. The Lord will provide. It is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Can you now see the connection? When did Abraham, when did he notice the ram? When did he see the substitute? Before or after? You see, when you obey God completely, 
then you will discover God's faithfulness. You don't discover God's faithfulness when you are compromising. Amazing reality. God provides for our needs, His time, His ways. You will never know what God can do until you have nothing left except God. Amen? When you surrender all, you discover God. Look at the next verse. The next verse tells us, by the way, in the mouth of the Lord, where is this mountain? In the mouth of the Lord. Ah, I will not tell you Moriah. Where is Mount Moriah? Let's read. Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. You see, Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is the place where Solomon's temple was built. And Jesus died in the area of Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is a mountain range, okay? So I want you to know now, where is Mount Moriah? In Jerusalem. What did Jesus do in Jerusalem? He offered himself. So, let's read together. Verse 22, 15, 16. The angel of the Lord called Abraham second time by myself. Notice, the angel of the Lord speaking. But now he's saying he's God. By myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord. So the Lord is now equal to the angel. I'm not inventing this. This is from the Bible. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, because of obedience, continue reading, I will not just bless you. Now he added the word, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply you. You see, you will never know the blessings of God until you surrender all, until you obey all. Your seed as the stars of the heavens, as the sun which is on the seashore, your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Amazing promise. Israel, listen to me, will always win any battle in the Middle East. Because this is God's prophecy. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Notice, in your seed. Who is the seed of Abraham that blessed the whole world? Anybody? Because you have obeyed my voice. Who is that seed? How can the seed of Abraham bless the entire world? Because Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 tells us, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham all the nations will be blessed in you. You see the gospel is embedded in the book of Genesis chapter 12. It talks about the promised Messiah. Then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ. We are sons of God through faith in Christ. You belong to Christ. Then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. Are we part of God's amazing plan? Yes or no? Yes. You are the descendants of the promised child, Abraham. Amen? So, my friend, look at this chart. Isaac and Jesus. A type. Isaac is a type of Jesus. That's what the Bible says a while ago. A child of promise. Jesus is a child of promise. Loved by his father. Loved by the father. Only son. Isaac, Jesus. Miraculous birth. Barren. Virgin birth. Carried the wood for his own sacrifice. Jesus carried the wooden cross. Willingly surrendered. Jesus willingly died for you and for me. Sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Difference. A substitute was provided. In Jesus, no substitute. He was your substitute. 
2,000 years ago, you now see the heart of God. When God saw His Son willingly suffered and died, you now see the heart of a father. And that's why God says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. No substitute for Jesus. You know why? He was the payment for your sins. If Jesus gave his all for you, how do you love him back? Everybody, obey. Number two, faith. Trust him. And lastly, you worship him. You know the cost of surrendering may be costly. But let me warn you, the cost of not surrendering is more costly. You know why? You will not know what you will miss when you do not surrender your all. Let me repeat. If you don't surrender your all today, yes, it can be costly, but it's more costly. You know why it's costly if you don't surrender? You will never know what you will miss. My friend, my wife surrendered her life to the Lord years ago. I surrendered my life to the Lord. We met. We obeyed the Lord. And as I look back, I realize the blessings. The blessings of countless spiritual children. Simply because years ago, my wife and I, plus the people who disciple you, they surrender their all to Jesus. Let me close with the importance of surrendering. My friend, Isaac is not always sinful. It can be a blessing. But what is God asking you to do? What are your Isaacs in life? You see, all of us have Isaacs. It can be your career. It can be your family. It can be your children. God bless you. But they have now taken the place of God in your life. I know of young couples. They serve God. But once they have children, it became their idols. They stopped worshiping. They stopped serving in the group because they are so busy with their child. Let me tell you, sooner or later, your child will leave you. But all you have is God. But you will never know. If you put your child ahead of you, you put your business ahead of you, God is asking you today, surrender your Isaac. What's your Isaac? Do you have an Isaac? Yes or no? It may, it may not be bad. It's something good. But you make that Isaac more important than God. It can be a boyfriend. It can be a career. It can be your own reputation. As we close, I'm always reminded of this story of a father who gave his daughter, when she was a young girl, a beautiful necklace. And she loved that necklace. As she grew older, she kept wearing it. Then she became a teenager. When she was about to hit uh, 18, the father kept asking her, can you surrender that necklace to me? The girl did not want to surrender the necklace because the girl learned to love the necklace. But every time they are together, the father will say, baby, I know you love that necklace. Will you surrender that to me? She decided to avoid the father because every time they are together, the father is saying, will you surrender the necklace to me? But one day, she got convicted. She said, it's not worth it. I would rather spend time with my father. He loves me. I will surrender the, my necklace. Should he ask again? And lo and behold, they were in the living room with the fireplace. And the father said, honey, it has been some time. But will you surrender your necklace to me? You know, she got her necklace and gave it to the father in tears. And the father got the necklace. And the father threw it in the fireplace. 
and it melted. You know why? The father said, for the longest time, I've been wanting you, I've been wanting to give you a true necklace. See, that first necklace was plastic. It's like pearl, plastic pearls. But this one is genuine. The father said, here is my gift to you. See, many of you are like that girl. You cling on to your plastics. You cling on to counterfeits. They will never give you happiness. They will never give you real joy. And God the Father is saying, surrender that to me. My friend, you need to surrender. You will not know the love of God until you surrender your all. That's called worship. Let's bow our heads and pray. If God has spoken to you, and you need to surrender your Isaac, will you raise your hand? You want to surrender your Isaac, God is telling you. You love me? All right, if you love me, surrender your all. Anybody else, raise your right hand. In fact, stand up, I will pray for you. If you want to surrender your Isaac to him, just stand up and raise your, both of your hands, surrender. Look at my posture, just surrender everything. Everybody, if you want to surrender your Isaac and you want to worship God, to worship God is to give him your entire life. Give him your best, whatever is your best. I will assure you, you can never outgive God. Today, God is listening to you. God is watching you. God knows your heart. So will you pray privately right now? Just say, Lord, I surrender all. I surrender my Isaac. Father God in heaven, I pray for these men and women who are standing up, declaring their complete surrender of Isaacs. Whatever that is, Lord Jesus, assure them that you always have something better. Thank you for your love for us. You became our sacrifice. And now I commit to you, all of us, that we will learn to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Good day, CCF family. Welcome to Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real-life questions and we give you biblical truths. I'm Gio Pentino from Big Singles Ministry, and we're here today with our speaker, Pastor Peter Tanchi, to answer some of your questions. Hi, Pastor. How are you? Good. Praise God. Thank you for reminding us about obedience and surrender. We have three questions for you. For our first question, in the context of the story of Abraham and Isaac, why would a loving God answer our prayers only to take the answered prayer away. The reason is God wants to test our heart. Sometimes answered prayer becomes an amazing blessing, but that blessing can become an idol. So God is testing us to make sure you don't make the answered prayer God, because it will lead to disaster. So God was protecting Abraham from future problems. Just like anybody, once you make blessing, answer prayer, more important than God, you're in trouble. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Peter. For our second question, one of the lessons you've taught us in several messages is motion before emotion. But for some people, despite their consistent motion of obedience, it seems that the emotion did not follow. Instead of being grateful for their obedience, they have grown weary and at times even resentful. What is your encouragement to these people? It is not enough just to have motion before emotion. Mm -hmm. You've got to correct your thinking. Okay. And if your thinking is wrong, your emotion will forever be wrong. Example, if you think that what you are doing is not your best interest, mm -hmm. if you think God is wrong, if you think your ways are better, how will that solve your emotional problem? So you need to come to a point where you correct your thinking, yes. including mistakes. Mistakes God will use to accomplish His purpose because we have an amazing God. Amen. Praise God for that answer, Pastor Peter. For our last question, how do we trust and obey when we are in urgent need of a solution to our problem? That's the warning. 
<laughs> Don't rush. To pray is to wait. Our problem is waiting. Okay. Abraham made a mistake by not waiting. You and I will make mistakes if we don't wait. See, waiting is hard because it seems like God is not doing anything. But my mistake has always been when I don't wait. And blessing is when I wait. I like God's answer better than my own. Amen. Wait on the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Peter, for answering our questions. And that's it for CCF Sunday Fast Track. God bless everyone.